behind us was a massive stadium sized craft in the air. And my dad and I being on the outside of the Jeep hopped out and we I mean, we both stood there and we can both recall the event now you can talk to my dad and my mom as well. My grandfather's not passed, but he remembered it as well. Um, we were just sort of paralyzed in awe. My dad sort of um, famously in my memory and his too, he's like, Jesus, it's like a skyscraper on its side. You know, I know there's, a, there's some factions out there um, um, who think that this might be the devil, or these might be demonic. And I don't think that's true. I really think that that is um, a projection of our fear. And, you know, we're only technological now. It's just, it's really a recent thing. You know, if we're born into this era, we think it's always been like this, but the computer is new. Uh, the microwave is new. The fax machine is actually quite new. All of this is quite new. And, uh, but as we are becoming, especially with AI coming to the forefront and, and understanding of quantum computing, maybe that's the nature of the universe, that it is this non-biological computer of sorts. I mean, again, who knows, but I think we're on the precipice of something really, really paradigm shifting. The following is my conversation with Tony Dean Smith. Tony is a director, screenwriter, and editor. He's also a very talented musician who's based out in Canada. Tony directed a great film called Volition, which he co-wrote with his brother Ryan. Tony has directed a number of films, including The Killer Downstairs, Mercy, Disappearance in Yellowstone, and TV shows like Robson's Arms. In this conversation, we discussed Tony's own sighting decades ago, along with his family members in South Africa, his thoughts on the link to consciousness and the UAP UFO phenomenon, as well as touching on the link to his uh, science fiction writing and filmmaking. Tony is just a, a lovely warm guy who I could talk to for hours and I genuinely felt like I've known him for, for many years, despite never meeting in person. A really cool guy with a really positive take on the uh, UFO UAP subject. So the following is my conversation with Tony Dean Smith. <laughs> jimmy hey tony how are you good to see you man great good to, to see great... you too yeah people yeah. won't know that we've been we've been talking a bit behind the scenes i've been trying to get you on to the podcast for quite a while but you've been super busy i know that work comes first um you've been filming and stuff but yeah. um I've been, yeah, I've been kind of waiting quite a while. You've, you've, you gave me a bit of a nugget a while ago and I thought I would need to hear more about this and then I obviously work. <laughs> I apologize, work. you know, and it's true. I mean, work does come first, but the truth yeah. is um, for both of us, this is really, uh, this is the most important work, you know? So I appreciate again, what you do and, uh, and what we're trying to all do together as a collective to, you know, bring this all to the surface. Um, yeah many varied experiences that we've all had and, and interests that we've we've shared so yeah again i just thank you for really what you do and what you're doing no thank you i appreciate that yeah. can we um are we okay to sort of jump into where it started with you and, and what first kind of piqued your interest in the ufo uap subject yeah um i mean you know, so i had an experience i had a, a a pretty unique experience when i was 12 years old which we can talk about but but the truth is, I, you know, I was um, I was born in South Africa in Johannesburg, and uh, in 1984, Halley's Comet came by the Earth, and I was obsessed with the stars from a young age. Um, I had my own telescope. I would be out at night looking at the stars, and my my poor siblings were my my little subjects, and I was their ruler. And I actually I had a comet club where I would teach them about the stars and the and the Pleiades and Sirius and. And all these things that I really didn't realize had actually connections to some, you know, bigger ideas. Um, but so I was, you know, I loved ET. I loved Close Encounters. I was primed to um, kind of be into the subject without really knowing it. And um, so again, really just into our into the universe, our place in it, how much we really don't know about what we are, or where we came from. Um, and I could actually remember when I was, uh, but just before we immigrated, when I was maybe 10 years old, I remember seeing a William Shatner documentary about sort of like an ancient alien concept. Um, and you can dig it up, it's out there on YouTube, I don't recall the name, but I just remember seeing, you know, ancient African tribes sort of, sort of celebrating these spacemen. 
and you know it just always stuck with me um and uh and then yeah if you'd like we can jump into really what really piqued my interest um if you're ready to jump into that yeah let's do it absolutely yeah so we uh we were setting out to immigrate to canada from from johannesburg south africa and about two months before we immigrated we went to, uh, on a game reserve, uh, which is a safari, you know, game reserve, seeing the, the, the animals in their natural habitat. Uh, it was called the Mabula Game Reserve, and it was just south of Zimbabwe. Little did I know that that would also be, uh, you know, uh, the Harare uh, area of the Harare sighting was very, very close. Um, the aerial school sighting, that is. Yeah. Um, but basically we went out with my family of seven. That was myself, my parents, my grandfather, and my, my three siblings. I was the oldest. I was a very, very mature 12 years old. And we went out in an open Jeep in the daytime to go see the, the daytime animals. And then we all went to sleep. We had, you know, we had dinner, we went to sleep. And then they woke us up around two in the morning to go see the nocturnal animals. And, uh, maybe an hour into our, our, our trek through the, through the night, um, you know, I was sitting on, I was sitting in the back row with the other family of four and my dad was sitting in the front row with my, with, uh, my mom and my siblings and my grandfather was actually sitting uh, there as well. There was the person driving the car and the person with a shotgun, literally in the passenger front seat, just in, in case they needed it with the animals. But so we're driving along and all of a sudden the Jeep just comes to a stop and there's, you know, hilarious South African accented commotion. Like, Jesus Christ, yes, guys, 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 look, look, look. <laughs> and they pointed behind us. And, and again, there's no city, there's no mountains, there's no lakes. Uh, this is dark, dark African skies. Um, behind us was a massive stadium-sized craft in the air and my dad and i being on the outside of the jeep hopped out and we i mean we both stood there and we can both recall the event now you can talk to my dad and my mom as well my grandfather's not passed but he remembered it as well um we were just sort of paralyzed in awe of, of, of seeing this thing and you know my dad sort of um famously in my memory and his too he's like jesus it's like a skyscraper on its side Meaning that like all these lights were blinking like a like the Empire State Building, but on its side, and you know you could see sort of like a very faint top layer, bottom layer. I mean, a classic, what we'd now call a UAP, but a UFO. And um, I mean, it was very strange, in all honesty. And I and I've tried to like talk myself out of the experience. Like, oh come on, maybe it was a mass hallucination. Maybe it was a who knows what uh, too much something in the rooibos tea in south africa i don't know but but um but my dad to this day we he still recalls the six floors of blinking lights and um and then the strange i mean i guess like the equally strange thing is that we remember it sort of in the distance maybe it was a kilometer away and then we remember it being more above us shooting off into into outer space and you know, the way it shot off, it had no sound, it had no visible propulsion. Um, and it just, you know, it, I, you know, and now learning more about what these things may be able to do, um, maybe it dematerialized and just seemed to travel away, or it traveled away at, at just a supersonic light speed, um, yeah. you know, trajectory. Uh, yeah. And what, what sort of um, kind of shape are we talking about? Did you kind of get an idea of a, you know, a, a kind of a shape and, and a, a material? Was there a kind of an idea of of the kind of material it was made out of, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, it felt, uh, I mean, the shape was, you know, I'll just, I'll just draw it qu quickly, but I mean, it's the classic, uh, the classic shape. Um, I'm doing a very quick, terrible drawing here, but I mean, the classic saucer, saucer yeah. shape. You know, with with the middle being all the lights, and then the top and the bottom being kind of a metallic. I mean, it was truly bizarre. I mean, we almost remember seeing like pieces that were, um, even within like the the metal metallic outside, um, not not rivets, but just it was almost like incomprehensible. Of course, um, and and there was again definitely a, a feeling of. We don't know if two minutes went by or five minutes went by, but it was, it was very strange. And the, and then you know after we just 
you know, we were having breakfast with the hippos, with the hippopotamus, like next to us. And, you know, again, I'm, I don't want to say that there was any kind of like abduction or anything like that. I just think there was some trauma yeah. of, of just seeing this thing and a bit of like kind of body paralysis in a way. Um, so that was the primary event. And, and I've had sort of some interesting follow-ups even, even since then. Um, and I am a science fiction writer, so I'm prone to um, speculation, but I'm also, um, you know, just open to, you know, I've, I've read a lot about what other people have experienced. And, um, you know, the equally strange thing about, about, I suppose, me and the experience was that, again, I was already into E.T. and Close Encounters and the stars. And my personality type is that when I get into something, I, I really don't shut up about it. Um, but, but we completely repressed the memory. Uh, I didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about it for a couple of years. Not that we forgot about it, but I don't know if there was like, obviously there was a stigma attached to it. And I remember when I first immigrated to Canada, I told one of my friends and, and he made fun of me. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, I don't feel safe talking about this and I'm not going to. Um, and it's only years later and, uh, and definitely since 2017, when, you know, since a lot of this have, has come to the forefront, that I've been much more open about sharing that story and then some of the follow-up, um, you know, experiences that happened. So, um, but that was, the, that was the primary event, yeah. What was, so are you, are you comfortable talking about the sort of follow-up stuff that's happened? I mean, you, you, you've kind of touched on that there are a few things that have happened sort of since then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm comfortable. It's um, I'm partially comfortable and and also equally uncomfortable because it's it's not quite a concrete event. I mean, where this was, you know, this was yeah. a shared experience um, with my entire family and even my siblings. You know, they're not sure if they remember it or if they remember us talking about it, and then they've, you know, sort of cobbled together memories. But you know, my sister was nine, and my brother was uh, six and a half, and my other sister was like four and a half. So they were quite young. Um, but, you know, but my parents and myself and my grandfather could all independently draw the same thing and, and without prompting tell you like what happened at the game reserve that night. And that's what I started to ask when I was, when I was around 14 in, in Canada, I was like, do you remember what, what we, what happened that night? And my parents were like, oh yeah, we saw that thing in the sky, you know? And so, um, so it turns out that my parents, um, never let us know this, but my parents were actually quite, um, you know, into sort of philosophy and, and spiritual searching, and they never put it on their kids. You know, we didn't grow up religious at all, but my parents were actually quite, quite, um, I suppose, spiritual and, and open to whatever this existence may be. And so uh, when I was around 16, 17, uh, I discovered their bookshelf. And on their bookshelf was uh, with Lee Stryber's Communion, and a lot of other books about um, Kabbalah and Buddhism and in all sorts of different um, uh, comparative religious studies. And um, so I started to to read a little bit and the um, the Whitley, the Stryber book um, or Whitley Strieber, I'm not sure how you pronounce his, his last name. Um, it really resonated with me and and he talked a lot about um, Egyptology and how in Egyptology, all the gods are all birds with these big eyes. And that became very interesting to me in that, you know, people that have experienced um, contact um, tend to, especially maybe in the ancient days, would, because of the trauma, they, they couldn't quite understand what they were seeing. So they attached these, these bird gods, these things that could fly in the air and then come down. So anyway, I started to um, read a lot about uh, that material and this is in 1994 five you know pre-internet um and so around the same time um and this is where it gets a bit like kind of esoteric and maybe airy fairy and that and that's that's fine i can i can deal with the skepticism with with all of this actually finally but i was um i got into uh meditating a lot and i would meditate every night and uh and I would be able to um, very quickly in, induce kind of body paralysis, out of body experiences within like a minute. And, and if I now remember my childhood, I was doing it when I was five years old. I remember being in my bedroom 
and crying that I was stuck in my ceiling watching myself in my bed or, or uh, at my door, but looking at back at myself. And these were like vivid, vivid memories. Um, so when I started meditating, I was having this happen again. And, uh, you know, I'm open to the fact that maybe it's a mental illness, maybe, but maybe not. Um, but through the meditation, um, I found myself this one night um, having a body paralysis, out of body experience. And all of a sudden my environment changed to um, this sort of like this house party, this high school house party. And uh, all of a sudden, and you know, outside on the lawn at the house party, everyone is looking at the star that's moving closer and closer to us. And everyone's freaking out and they're like, oh my God, get your guns, look, they're coming, they're coming. And I was like, guys, you have nothing to worry about. We are hostile, they are not like, you know, it's really interesting that this is at, this is at 17 years old or so that I was, having these, these thoughts. Um, and so everyone was like panicked. And I went out into the middle of the lawn and, and waited for this thing to get closer and closer. And sure enough, it was the same thing that I saw when I was 12. It was the same ship. And then all of a sudden, uh, I was felt myself being uh, beamed up again in a dream, body paralysis, kind of lucid dreaming. I was aware that I was dreaming. Um, and I was pulled up and instantly I was in this incredible translucent, like, I mean, the materials were very different than what we have here. It was like a library. It felt like a university think tank. Um, and they had all these books everywhere, these ancient manuscripts everywhere. And, and I opened up uh, curiously just one of the books and it was all very, very strange hieroglyphics. I couldn't understand it at all, except for at the very bottom, it said Kilroy was here. And it's the only thing in English. And I didn't know what it meant at the time, again, pre internet. And then I hear this voice behind me. And as he says, and it was Tony, and I turned around and it's this, this old wise man, and clearly I had seen the never ending story. And I was, you know, putting, a, you know, uh, maybe some kind of like surface structure to something that I could maybe deal with. But he said, uh, Do you understand what's being what's being written what's being shown to you? And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't understand the language. And he took the book from me and he said, well, if you can't help yourself, we can't help you. And he closed the book and, and I shot back into my body. And, uh, and I always remember this. I mean, it was a very, very vivid experience. Um, and it, it just always stuck with me, you know, the, both the visceral experience, even though, you know, it was likely just a lucid dream. I don't think there was any, again, abduction or anything like that. Um, but because of that experience and a couple of other ones through meditation, I actually stopped meditating for about 15 years because it was too intense, too overwhelming. I, I didn't know what it meant. And so, and again, I would be able to put myself in that state very quickly just by lying on my back. So I stopped sleeping, I stopped ever sleeping on my back, which is hard to do anyway. Um, and, uh, I think I have a sore shoulder because of it, because now sleeping on my side forever. Um, but then I actually, uh, after 2017, um, a, a good friend of mine, um, I'm thinking about whether I say his name or not. Uh, he's a, he's a wonderful actor. Um, but his dad was actually in charge of Canada's, uh, UFO, uh, studies, including circle crops. And so him and I, um, little did we know I made my first feature film when I was, when I was 20. And it was about somebody that doesn't realize then they're they've died and then they're in the afterlife and they get a chance to come back and it's you know very kind of esoteric and spiritual. But he was in that film, and I was keeping my UFO secrets because I didn't want anyone to know what I experienced. And he, as it turns out, was keeping his own secrets because we were both ashamed. Again, his dad was uh, one of the one of the leading scientists in in the crop research and UFO field. Um, so years went by and then we became, you know, after 2017, when the stuff started to come out, we started talking and, um, and he said to me, you know, kind of like the Stephen Greer idea that, you know, we're actually all energy. It's, you know, it's the illusion of, of separation because we're in these skin suits that we think, you know, we're private and alone and, and, and whatever that may be, but, but potentially these things can, can, can communicate to us through more telepathic means, which is again, very consistent with what a lot of these 
aerial school children yeah. saw or were taught or were told and that if you are open and if you have a certain um, type maybe they communicate through you and 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 I was already open to that kind of and it really it sounds like quite ridiculous because we're all special no one's like more unique than anyone else but but maybe some people can like tap into different things for different reasons and as a science fiction writer I mean I sort of felt that even when I was 16 17 18 that like maybe you know if they are trying to help us grow as a as a society as a planet so we can join the greater society um maybe they'll use they'll use Spielberg and 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 his non-hostile approach to at least through close close encounters and, and et to tell stories of um of benign beings that can that can help us grow and find love and um so he just said you know you know maybe that dream that you had um wasn't a dream maybe it was um you know maybe they don't need physical craft and physical means to contact us like if we can meditate through a certain practice maybe maybe they did actually touch base with you um so i was open to that idea and he's like why don't you start meditating again why don't you start again and i was really terrified uh to do so but uh maybe a year and a half ago i started to try it again and, and sure enough i was having very very quick kind of body paralysis experiences where i was you know i was aware that i was asleep and then i was aware that i was separate from my physical body you know and the astral plane as it's been called by some um and uh and so sure enough this one day i was meditating it was it was uh, it was kind of late afternoon and i found myself awake outside of my body and and again i'm very open to just being a dream of course of course i am um but i felt this hum there was like this really low vibration hum that i was feeling and i was looking around my apartments walking in a lucid dream state around my apartment and i went out to my balcony because the sound was coming from the outside and i opened my sliding door and and the sound was a little bit louder and sure enough up above my building where I currently live was the same ship that I saw in my dream when I was 16, 17, 17 was the same ship that we saw when I was 12. And, uh, and I was aware that, oh my God, I've, I've either produced this through my, my brain, through the way we can create imagery and symbolism, uh, or like my friend has said, maybe they're touching base. And so, as I felt myself actually being pulled towards the craft, um, my I was in such a fear state that I started to like you know wiggle my toe and 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 pull myself out of my body paralysis state, and then I woke up again and and it was gone. But like always, my body was vibrating like crazy, and that was a very common experience I had through the meditation when I was going yeah. through these experiences. Um, so anyway, that was. That was one of the follow-ups. And then the last piece is that, um, you know, I've been wanting to make a, uh, a narrative uh, UFO, UAP film and trying to find the right angle through it. And obviously my, my primary experience is probably where I start with it. Um, but I know it's going to, um, you know, it's not an action flick. And again, I think we're the hostile ones. They, they are not. And, and you know, and I've done a lot of reading into um, what Stephen Greer has to say, and and the Disclosure Project, and and the press conference he had in two thousand one that was just before nine eleven. I mean, it's really fascinating, and the idea being that like you know, two things can be true at the same time. Number one, these uh, these non human this non human intelligence as we're now calling it um, has clearly been here forever. I think they are absolutely with us and want us to survive our adolescence and not blow, blow each other up, you know, over whose symbolism of the way to God is correct, because every way is correct if it's done through kindness. Um, um, and so, uh, so I was just really like contemplating what what that all meant and and the film I wanted to make and that the truth is I feel very scared I feel scared because 
Um, saying the stuff out loud is, is borderline crazy, and I accept that. <laughs> um, but that two things could be true. Again, they've, they've been here forever, and maybe the crashes really did happen. And now we're talking about, you know, retrieved craft and what, what, what David Grush has come forward and, and disclosed and what, you know, Commander Fravor is seeing and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very, very exciting. But the other side could also be true that potentially a part of the military of the the aerospace private military has gone rogue and that it's possible that they've also reverse engineered a craft and uh during the the press conference in 2001 it was um i can't remember her name but it was professor von brown's uh, uh sort of protege who said that you know after communism, terrorism, all these isms, they might use a, they might reverse engineer one of these craft to create a false flag and scare us all into submission. So that's been on my mind for a little while here. And I actually did write something that was kind of about that, about, you know, whistleblowers coming forward to almost take back the truth, expose the dark side of the military, not expose America as a bad player, because I don't even think America knows what's really going on here. But there might be something underneath it all that is um, not benign, that is us. And so only, uh, only uh, it was just actually before my birthday in October this year, I was doing some meditation again and just thinking about all of these events that I've had. And then Kilroy was here, popped into my mind again. And I had recently found my book of dreams because I always used to write them down when I was, when I was going through this stuff. And so I finally looked up on the internet. I mean, it's bizarre that it took me so long to do so. But Kilroy was here is something that the United States used to write to scare the Germans and the Japanese during World War II, that the United States had been here. And, you know, I just, it's bizarre that I had that at 17 years old and now I'm 46. And with everything that's come out now, Kilroy was, Kilroy was here now might mean that watch out for the false flag. Yeah. It might mean that, or, or maybe it means that, um, that these intelligent beings are siding with the United States on some level, because, you know, I don't know, it's, it's complex and I have a lot of thoughts about it and I'm not super comfortable with any of it, but again, I'm a science fiction writer, so I'm prone to fantasy, but, yeah. uh, it's, it's fascinating that you've got you, you feel a lot sort of safer talking about the the event that multiple people witnessed but the the stuff that kind of happens alone I, I hear that so much and I think that's why a lot of um sightings and experiences people just kind of suppress because it's kind of it's not safe it's it's so easy for someone to say oh, you're just sleeping or you're just mad whereas yeah. if you've got this you, you know several people have seen or experienced something at the same time they're able to kind of same with you and your family to draw draw those kind of same kind of images it's so much safe, isn't it? Because it's if somebody says, "Well, that didn't happen," or "You didn't experience that," well, then the other person seems a bit strange rather than you. Because well, my entire family, you can speak to my family, you know, and right. and that's far more more realistic. It's far more likely that something happened. You know, they can debate what it was, but that something certainly happened. Whereas when you're alone in your, you know, in, yeah. in your house or in your bedroom, it's easy for people to say, "Well, that didn't happen." You've got a, an overactive imagination. That's right. That's right. I think you're. So completely... if I've... I find that kind of fascinating, really. And, and I think that's kind of partly why so much is coming out now is because it's it's becoming safer to talk about. And actually, there's so much coming out now about consciousness, about um, people that meditate, about kind of stuff coming out about remote viewing, all sorts of things that are around the kind of consciousness um, yeah. elements of things. Um, so, I'm keen. I'm keen to know just from from your kind of work. I, I see that um, you know your from your film and your writing and stuff like volitions. You, there's it's like a, a paranormal. And I know there's a clairvoyance in in um, yeah. in volition. Um, do you think that that kind of has? And you sort of touched on it yourself with sort of Spielberg and stuff. I, I've spoken to a few people now who um, you know on the podcast and, and outside of the podcast. People like Chris Romwell who had an experience as a, as a child. He's now writing a UFO related script uh, or screenplay. Um, same with Jamel Howard. He, you know, he's got this super, um, I don't think so much he had an experience, but he's had this super interesting, um, super interest in it from a very young age and uh, is now writing a script. And it's kind of, do you feel like 
potentially that's that's something that's kind of almost been given to you to then you know you kind of touched on that with someone like Spielberg for example like he's a really good person to put kind of a message out that's kind of safely resonates with people a certain message do you think there could be something in that I, I do think I do think so um you know and I don't think it's something that uh you know again we don't know what we are we don't know if there's such a thing as as the afterlife reincarnation I mean I, I tend to think there is I tend to think that where there's some kind of continuum of of maybe the self through time whatever the whatever time is and whatever the self is I mean we really we don't know what the stuff is but as far as what consciousness is and what it might be I mean we're seeing already that um, what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink and that the idea that you know the brain is actually full of like you know electrons that can that can be um, sort of uh, paired like Bluetooth with computers and and you know all the all the ancient mystics talked about like the more telepathic state of our being and now almost science and through quantum physics is actually kind of catching up to a lot of that and so for whatever reason yeah maybe some people um you know some people are incredibly gifted with music or with mathematics and they could do it from a young age and you know there's certain things that that I have seemingly brought with with me at a from a young age and we all you know i think it's a big chessboard and we all have gifts and we all have different uh the world needs all of us to participate you know in in our gifts and so um you know there's a strange uh there's a strange openness in in my family is the truth my again my parents have this like secret spiritual background that they never talked about um my dad was uh, an illusionist magician uh and so so was my grandfather and so there's um i don't know there seems there seems to be something to that and um you know and i do think it communicates through us but i think i remember this one quote where like language is a form of organized stutter and and i don't know who who said it but the the idea being that you know if you're open if you can sort of strip away the ego a little bit um i think we're all uh receivers and you know we we certainly know that the phone is just a piece of hardware that receives data from the cloud now if we invented that in the last 30 so years i mean the universe is we now think 26 point something billion years old not 13 point something Sure, and with our, our DNA coding and the way everything is just perfectly designed, and even if it uses evolution to manifest itself, there's something much bigger going on here. And I think that, I think it does use us to, um, you know, to, I, you know, to almost find the light, to refine our energy, to like, you know, we want to, I think, be together and as one and not through a, and I think like, you know, people that are more fear-based see like becoming one as like communism or socialism. And that's not, that's not what I mean. I mean, like the natural state of us actually seeing each other as, as um, unique pieces to one puzzle, you know, and when the puzzle comes together, this emergent property comes forth and we get to see that oh wow this is actually what it was all about from the beginning um so i don't know if that answers your question but yeah uh, absolutely absolutely and um i think you're you're also a very unique person tony and i'm, I'm i get um and it sounds a bit strange because i know that we've never physically met but you know we've yeah. talked a little bit and i get a real kind of sense of warmth from you i love that i, I was you know before before i um i start a podcast have a look at um people's whatever i can find online really of, of yeah. people's past and history and stuff and i love seeing bits and pieces of your family and you know when you were younger and stuff with your your, your parents and it's um it's yeah. it's it's quite unique you are quite a unique character in in um from what you know from what i can see and and there's a real kind of warmth that comes from you and i think um you know it's it's yeah. it's really nice to see genuinely really lovely to see and i get this kind of sense from you and and it's interesting because you you're interested in this subject you've clearly done or had a lot of time to think about it and 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 you know you're a very creative person clearly but it, i get that energy from you and i and we've never met you know we've never physically met but yeah i i do get that energy from you which is Thank unique you. and yeah and and i don't you know i spoke to quite a few people on the podcast and i couldn't say the same about other people you know 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I it's uh, thanks. Thank you for saying that. It's really obviously nice to hear. Um, it it there there's it's in my family. There's a. It's funny. We're all we're all like this. So maybe that's just parenting and in just yeah. sort of downloaded um, you know beliefs and and all of that. Um, but I I do think the you know I mean, I've worked on myself a lot too. You know so. But, you know, warmth and kindness and um, it's just I think it's I think it's where we all need to, you know, hopefully get to. And, and I mean, the world is obviously in a very, very um, precarious place. And there's a lot of hostility and a lot of a lot of sort of conquering and dividing and, and getting back to like fighting over symbols and fighting over this and that. And I think I think the only way through it all is 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 going to be dialogue and. Um, so I feel, you know, I just feel again, and it's why I thank you for doing what, what you do, because you're allowing um, all of us to speak from from the heart and from the mind and from our experiences. And uh, and then ultimately, like, we're all here together. There's nothing actually to be afraid of. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, anyway, thank you. I mean, I think I, I feel like my films as well, you know, even, you know, Volition, which is the film that you mentioned about that are just dealing with sort of paranormal psychic phenomenon. Um, it's the same, it's, it's ultimately very life affirming. You know, it's a character that goes through some darkness. The character doesn't believe in free will at all. They believe that they're fated. Um, and it's about somebody who actually has a vision of their own imminent murder. It's kind of like a, you know, Tarantino slash Christopher Nolan type of film. But ultimately it's very life affirming and that we, we actually do have free will. We might have to push really hard against our beliefs, but, uh, but you know, that we do come out and sometimes we have to go through almost our biggest fear to come out of the other side. And, and in, in fact, with this subject, um, it's very true for me. I've had to really, I've been really afraid of speaking about this. Um, I mean, I've sat on it forever. And, uh, so, um, you know, a sign of maybe growth for all of us, um, to not be afraid to, to, to come forth and, and speak the truth. And, uh, you know, I do think that the danger is it's going to it's going to potentially upset the apple cart. You know, there's there's a yeah. big there's a big sort of artificial structure. I know um, uh, Daniel Sheehan has talked about uh, this sort of false structure that we kind of have accepted is reality. Like you have your country, your religion, your thing, your this, but we're actually all Earthlings, and um, and you know, as I really think as unique as we are, that must be the same, you know, whatever we think of, whether it's whether it's um, theism or atheism, both should be able to coexist. It's you should both be able to express both through kindness, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm meandering here, but, uh, but it is. No, really no, you make you make a good point. And it, it kind of, for me, I get that feeling that it's kind of, we must make sure people pay their taxes, you know, it kind of, from, yeah. from a kind of government uh, perspective, if this changes things, whatever yeah. changes, we must make sure people, yeah, you know, still right. pay the taxes. And I know it's a, it's a, right. a, a cliche kind of thing, but it, exactly right. we, you know, we've created these, I say we, you know, governments and stuff have created these yeah. um, processes and, and policies and procedures and laws. And we kind of, this is something that could potentially just turn everything upside down in, in the eyes of some. And I think, Absolutely. you know, it's, is, is it going to be interesting to see how, if we do get disclosure and if, you know, UAP disclosure act, I did want to talk about that actually and see yeah. what your thoughts were on it. But if we were to get some kind of formal disclosure, yeah, how, how it would impact us as a, as a kind of a nation, you know, the U S and UK, for example, sure. and, and, you know, I, I've got my kind of opinions on how it will, how it will kind of affect us as a, as a species, but in terms of kind of our day to day, you know, what does the next day look like? So Monday we get some formal disclosure from, you know, yeah. from Joe Biden, for example, yeah. and then all of a sudden people don't, you know, there's no kind of, well, this may be nonsense. Well, the government have just come out and said, this is right. legitimate. This is non-human. You know, we are not alone. What does yeah. Tuesday look like? You know? Yeah, exactly. And I think you're, you're, again, we're hovering right over the target, because I think that is what's holding this all back is that, you know, the way that we've built the earth and these these sort of power structures and this, I, you know, again, you should, again, we're the only animals on the planet that have to pay to live on the planet. Yeah. Um, 
which is which is interesting. But you know, if energy becomes free, and what Dr. Greer is talking about is that that's what's been suppressed for probably a hundred years now. Someone's someone's benefiting from us having to pay and pay taxes and to keep uh, you know these all we're digging we're just ruining the earth with what we're having to deal with um just so that somebody can go buy a yacht or the fifth yacht and like but what if yachts can be 3d printed so then why you know what i mean There's a, it's a whole paradigm shift that needs to happen but i think people are quite stuck on defending something that they just take as a as a superstructure where it's not it's an artificial structure and so, yeah, I'm very curious to what what the day after disclosure looks like. And um, and, you know, I actually see it. And again, I've because I'm a I've always been interested in, in comparative religion uh, since I've been a kid. And uh, and, you know, even just the metaphors of of Moses going to the Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And it just seems like in some ways, you know, we think the Bible is over we're still in it, you know, whatever, and it, whether the Bible is cobbled together and it's metaphors, stories, or if it really happened, you know, I, I don't know, but certainly history repeats itself and, and the human psychology and our, and our ability to um, manifest events again and again. And we all know that we go in from one relationship to another, to another, and my God, it's the same dynamic until we change, the dynamic does not change. And so I think on a larger scale, culturally, we might be facing, you know, stepping up to the corporations and saying, let the people go and um you know i'm very fascinated with the with the ancient alien theory and you know even the idea of moses going up to mount sinai and receiving the ten commandments and seeing the burning bush you know whether it happened or not but you know and this is not my idea certainly but the the, the generation that wrote those books were not technological and if you put a light behind a tree it's going to look like a burning bush and what if that light was a ufo you know, and what if it was a benign being saying, listen, the way to live here, and they didn't mean like be subservient to God and all of the things that come with that, but like to your higher self, to truth, to honorability, to loving your neighbor as yourself and honoring your parents and do not kill. It's actually a lot of good stuff in there. Um, if you take away some of the more fear-based parts of, you know, of religion, I think there's, I think we're kind of just about to replay the same story and I feel like we're about to go up to the pharaohs and I think we are doing that I think that's what David Grush is doing and uh and Lou Elizondo and and Chris Millen and I mean Gary Nolan we've got a lot of good good people on our side and so it's not just going to have to be one person going up to the machine and saying let our people go I think it's it's now a collective which is very I think exciting and encouraging yeah agreed do you feel like there's an element of, do you feel like there's kind of a, a need, even, uh, you know, somewhere sort of small and deep down in yourself that it feels like you need some kind of sort of validation, official validation that this stuff is real? Because if, if, if you're, if you've had this experience, this, you know, real significant experience um, when you're younger and your family have to hold on to that for such a long time, and to have it in there and there's, there's got to be a, an element and I, I don't want to speak for you, but there's got to be a, a very, you know, a, a percentage, shall we say, that says there's a, a possibility that this is a something else, whether it's a case of it didn't happen or it was um, government, you know, technology or something else other than, you know, this yeah. is non-human technology that was above me. Is there, do you feel like you have something inside you that kind of almost needs that kind of validation officially from the government to say yeah this stuff is real it's been here for thousands of years that stuff that people saw when they were kids etc but it's probably real you know there was some stuff over south africa there's some stuff over australia you know what i mean is yeah, yeah. there something in there that, that... I'm, I'm trying i'm trying that on as you're saying that um i think the answer first of all must must be yes there must be some part of me that that wants it um but it feels actually quite like i don't have a lot of energy around. I don't have a lot of charge yeah. that I need to be proven right because then it validates me. I yeah. I actually feel this is a much it's a much and it's a long it's a long game here. Mm -hmm. And that's you know for example what if we don't get disclosure in our lifetime? What if it takes longer and mm -hmm. and maybe that's okay too. And, and and I know a lot of people and I've heard you know George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell talk about that people are quite frustrated now because they want the answers now. But they don't quite realize that so much has happened in the last uh, six years that we kind of all thought were, were, was impossible for the longest time. And so the shifts are actually massive 
what are happening mm -hmm. now. And I think the collective, um, the collective of the world is, 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 is now certainly more open to the possibilities of this. And maybe that is the right step for one generation. Maybe, you know, like you're saying, maybe it is, if disclosure had to happen on the Monday, what does the Tuesday look like? Maybe they have good reason to not like just announce it all at once because you're dealing with a very sensitive um, belief system on the planet. And, you know, I'm very, I have, I have friends from all faiths and all, you know, religions or, or even atheists. And this can really, um, at first, I think, challenge them. Um, you know, a lot of people, and I remember even, I don't know if you ever read Childhood's End, Arthur C. Clarke, but fascinating book. I, I won't, I won't give it away. I think everybody should read it, but, you know, I know there's, a, there's some factions out there um, um, who think that this might be the devil or these might be demonic. And I don't think that's true. I really think that that is um, a projection of our fear. And, you know, if we've been told there's only one way to get to the light and that becomes almost trademark, it's like, it's almost, it's, you know, there's, there's organic food, then there's like fast food. And in some ways, I want to be respectful about what I'm about to say here, but religion at its worst, there's religion at its best, but at religion at its worst might be the, the drive by fast food way to getting to the, the truth. But there's, um, and there's truth within it. But you know, it, when it becomes politicized and becomes dogmatic, and it becomes almost like nationalistic, if that's not the, the epitome of idol worship, I don't know what is. And idol worship is the very thing that, you know, again, going back to the Ten Commandments, be very careful not to be fooled by surface structure. Because, you know, um, the, the nature of this, 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 maybe this consciousness, this non human intelligence, it takes many forms and it almost takes the form of what we need to see. And so, you know, I think if, for example, if even the idea of the, of the second coming or something like that, the chances of him or her looking exactly like we want him or her to look like are probably not going to be the case. We'll probably assassinate them. You know, and so I just think we, we need to, as we see our friends from different faiths, you know, we all have these unique fingerprints, but we're all clearly human. So surely the the search for God or or consciousness or oneness must be as varied. It must be um, because it's getting to the source, you know, and the source is nameless, probably. And then just is is energy um, and beautiful, I think, yeah. um, and benign and creative. And I mean, they say I mean, I've heard, you know, Professor Nolan talk about that. They're experiencing that these 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 things almost seem to have a, a sense of humor also, and to me that's the nature of actually us and animals. So we're, you know, if we're if we're not traumatized, we're actually quite playful with each other. It's when we become traumatized and then we start seeing shadows and we bark at the shadow and, you know, the shadow might just be someone that's trying to like help somebody through trauma, but. Yeah. You know, we can it's such a stuck. unique thing, isn't it? This the, the the when I heard um when I heard Professor Nolan make that comment about the humor, it it, it really took me back. I had to kind of think about that for a, for a minute. I think it's the first time I'd heard about this kind of sense of humor, and I've heard it a few times now from different um from different sources. Yeah. But it kind of makes you think. If you know, if you think of a, a mushroom or you know a tree is is a life form. Yeah. You, you can you can accept that's a life form. It you know you can see that it's doing things, it's staying alive. But if you were to say that tree's got a sense of humour, you think, you know, you've really got to get it's a mind bender, and um, it's fascinating. I mean, I'd like to know more um, about his his opinions on that. But it's interesting the use of words to kind of portray a, a real emotion because that when I heard he when I heard him say that it. You know, I probably had about half an hour where I, I could just try to process what he'd just said. You know, there was this real, almost a movement, um, you know, almost moving for me where I, I thought this is such a unique perspective and there must be so much more. It opens this whole new portal to to something that I hadn't thought about before. And I think you did the same. You, When we talked sort of behind the scenes, you, I think you commented that your experience felt wonderful. And I think you used the word wonderful. Mm. And I remember that was quite a powerful thing for me to hear. And I thought, wonderful, that's 
It's mm. a really interesting, you know, not sort of traumatic. It scared the hell out of me. And I'm sure there are elements of that in there as well. But the 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 word that kind of came to mind for you and, and really resonated with you was wonderful, which resonated with me when I heard it. Wow. Well, that's that's powerful to hear back. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that is how I felt. And I think I really think there's nothing to be afraid of at all. It's just it's just the unknown at first. It's going to become known. Um, and I think it's I think it's the bigger piece of ourselves. And I think that, you know, for, for all we know, as as AI is sort of coming to to the forefront and um, it's another form of intelligence that certainly we've created. Um, I think we're also going to find that it's going to have a sense of humor. I know we have a sense of humor and uh, and. Yeah, I just think that I think that's the nature of if you think about it, just creativity itself, creativity um, is full of humor and wonder. And, you know, you, you, you try something, you fail, no big deal, try again. There's there's love and humor in it. And and I think that, that must be if we're a subset of the universe somehow, again, I have no idea what we are it must be kind and benign and full of love and and probably i mean i know we we are the beings that maybe have the emotionality to have sadness and and uh, suffering and, and longing maybe the universe doesn't quite have to have that but um i have a feeling it wants us to succeed on some level um and i don't mean it in like a deity type of way but even if somebody does believe that i think that's that's great too um the question is where does the deity come from where does that i mean how does something come from nothing and how does nothing come from nothing i mean these are the questions that have blown my mind since i've been so young and um i think the answer is if we just look at ourselves and nature um we're creative and we're kind at our nature and, uh, and also it feels so good when you are creative and when you're kind or when you receive kindness, it feels good, you know, yeah. and that's, you know, yes. that's such a powerful thing, isn't it? Well, why does it feel good? If it, that's, it, that's, that's correct. That's right. That's the right thing because it feels good. You know, that's right. That's right. And I think, I think, you know, and it's all of us and we're all creative, no matter what, what we do or what vocation we yeah. find ourselves in, but expressing the self whether it's through fashion, whether it's through communicating a movie or a song that you liked, the expression of self is our nature. And it feels wonderful to parlay something that excites you to somebody else, or even to put it into a poem or a song or a movie, whatever our, or whatever our art form might be. Um, I think again, you know, just getting back to how we are a subset of the universe, you know, why did anything come into being? I think it must have just wanted to express itself, you know, and, and, you know, the whole evolution slash creationism, I, I obviously don't know, but I actually think they're one and the same, only based on what we do. You know, if, if I have an idea for a script, I write my first draft, it's terrible, but you know what? It was stage one of evolution. And then I put it aside and I learn from it. Then I reiterate and I reiterate and I reiterate and eventually it starts to take a more complex form. And even some of the more rudimentary crude ideas had a, had a place. And without those, you know, the scripts or the piece of art would never get to where it finally got to. And I think of, again, whatever the um, consciousness is, it must be endlessly patient and filled with love and humor and, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't remember being a caveman, but, you know, from dinosaur to cave person to us to whatever's coming next, it um, it just feels like, I don't know, I, it, there's randomness and I feel like there's purpose. There must be both on some level um, and that it's and that it's creative, you know, so. Yeah, I'm all I'm all here for it. And I and again, to get to get back to the wonderful comment. Um, yeah, there was there was no trauma. It was and I do feel that like post disclosure, I think it's going to be um, it's going to almost be a realignment of of the maybe the true nature of what this all is. Um, you know, I think some some people that m- might have had primary spiritual experiences, you know, when you try to teach them to other people without them having their own experiences, 
it can become dogmatic and politicized and and um, full of that person's uh, symbolism. But I again, I come back to I think we all have to we all have our journeys, and you know you can't force um, any idea onto anyone else. Um, it just takes time, individually and, and collectively. Absolutely. Yeah. Tony, can you talk about what you're working on now? Are you um so you've been filming uh out in Bulgaria, is that right? Yeah, I've been out in Bulgaria. What are you, what have you been working on? What are you what are you doing at the moment? Uh this is not a personal project, but it's a really, really fantastic project that is um with Paramount Plus and it is um I can't talk too much about it, but it's sort of a uh a Tarantino esque type of film. It's a it's got some Romeo and Juliet elements, and it's just about sort of uh, love and fate, and um, and uh, you know, kind of a morally ambiguous film, in a, which is difficult for me because I usually have much more kind of binary um, ideas about you know again being kind and life affirming, and it's so it's challenged me on that level, but it's also just really kind of honest and true, which is. Which has been great for me, um, but yeah, a brilliant film with uh, with Sienna Guillory and, and Jamie Bamford and John Voight and um, and a fantastic uh, just cast that uh, I'm really proud of the film. I think it probably comes out maybe you know within the year, um, and then uh, and then after that, I actually have a film that uh, I don't know. There's a film called Oh God that. It was a 1970s film with George Burns, John Denver. It's a really, really beautiful film. Um, but I have a film that's almost, um, you know, the the grandchild of that. And it really, it's about an, a nihilist, someone who's quite depressed, who doesn't believe in in anything, doesn't believe that we matter um, at all. And they find themselves um, in a bad state and eventually getting in a car accident. And they find themselves surviving the car accident. Uh, and they wake up in a hospital, um, but the hospital is not quite what uh, what it appears to be. And uh, it turns out they're in a form of the afterlife substation, but it's empty because they have no beliefs. You know, they don't they don't believe the afterlife exists. So it's sort of a manifestation of how they think it would be. So it's not this like heavenly spiritual place. It's kind of like a dry bureaucratic. Uh, building, but slowly they're given a chance to come back to. Um, I'm cutting this very short, but back to their body and through their own means, they help people realize that they matter. And um, again, very life affirming. And um, again, I hope I hope my essence comes through and that it is. And I think it is wonderful. Again, and you know, I think uh, I think cinema is still very powerful. And, yeah. and and, you know, I think Absolutely. it's been kind of potentially diluted a bit because there's no collective experience anymore. Everyone's watching things by themselves. And but I, I, I'm not giving up hope on that. I still think we're yearning for togetherness, actually. And yeah. uh, and I, I, I'm happy that it's actually become decentralized in some ways because it's allowed new voices to come forward. Um, but, yeah, that's that's what's next for me. Awesome yeah awesome well look tony i've um i've taken up enough of your time it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and i really hope we get to talk again in the future and i'm certainly going to keep an eye out on your work and love That's what you're doing thank you listen again thank you for having me thank you for all the the brilliant work you do it's i think it's there's nothing more important actually i think it's the next it's a big paradigm shift and, and you are at the forefront of it and and i watch all of your interviews and uh and again just can't thank you enough for being courageous enough um to uh to help to help all of us including yourself you know uh step into the next the next phase of existence yeah. so that's really kind thank you tony and so i mean can you what's your what's your background like with this stuff i don't know if i've uh well i don't so i've not experienced i've not experienced anything that i could say is um is anything that couldn't have a conventional explanation yeah um However, I've always, always had an absolute fascination with looking up. Mm. And I've always had a fascination in the subject. Mm. And I guess that's, it's always been there in the background. And I and probably the same as many people in 2017, stuff started coming out and we saw it a lot more. 
And I was very confused that we didn't see it as much in the UK, but it was all in American media. Yeah. And that, that was an interest to me. Yeah. And I guess, I don't know, I just, I found, I found a lot of the older stuff, a lot of the older clips that were sort of, had previously been circulating around, had slowly kind of died off and they were not really around anymore. And and yeah. the whole YouTube narrative, and uh, not narrative, the whole YouTube algorithm yeah. just pops up the really popular videos that are recent. And if you, you know, if you put in a, uh, I don't know, UFO sighting in London, for example, you'd perhaps get sort of 50 to 100 pages of the most recent, you know, newspaper articles. But that really, really interesting, really fascinating case from 30, 40 years ago, you know, you'd never find it on on YouTube. So I guess I just started documenting stuff and thinking, well, I'm going to put that put stuff onto an Instagram page that interests me and that I find fascinating. And you know, people started, um, you know, finding it useful, I guess, and and following yeah. the account and and people like yourself and others who kind of popped up and and interacted with the account. You yeah. seemed really interesting. You know, you, you seem like really in, you seem like really interesting characters and and and. Um, personalities and just different areas of the world and I thought I, I would never get an opportunity to talk to to these different people about the subject that we we both have an interest in yeah. and then the sort of podcast idea came up and here we are I think you're meant to do it I mean I think again I really believe that's whatever whatever this universe is I think it does we are it we're in it so we must be it must be speaking through us you know i mean somehow whatever that means but i mean your interest in it and again like you say looking up always looking up and always been interested i, I don't think that's an accident you know i think you know again i don't know what uh i don't know about reincarnation i don't know if there's a pre and a post life um but uh but we all might come here with preconceived or just i don't know i don't know if it's a mission or i don't know if we're i don't know i don't know but it does seem like, again, like you're, I mean, I can't thank you enough, like truly, um, you know, and I think whether you're experiencing these things in a concrete fashion or not, or have not yet, or, or soon will, or whatever it may be, I do think they're speaking through you. I really do. Um, and it's funny, we used to call these like angels or spiritual things, but I'm amazed that it's now like non-human intelligence makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that means, but uh you know, I think, I don't know, I'm sure you saw Christopher Nolan's um, Interstellar. Yeah. But even the idea of like, you know, with the, the interdimensionality of like, you know, this, this, when, um, you know, when he was in the spacesuit in the Tesseract and he's calling out to his daughter. Yeah. You know, so I've powerful. always believed that. I've just yeah. never seen somebody put it on film. Mm. And um, so I don't know. I, I do think it's speaking to us and through us. And, uh, who knows? You know, I think as long as we're still good and kind, but I do think we're up for quite a big fight going forward. You know, I really do. Post disclosure. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, I think we were kind of led to believe that perhaps things would be a bit easier by, um, <laughs> by some of the, the, the media commentators around the whole disclosure issue. And I think it's probably right. going to be a much yeah. slower process, but you know, like, like many people have said to me, like, I, I know what I saw. I know what I believe. I don't That's need right. them to tell me. But I think that there's still that 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 element there where actually it would it feels as though it would be useful to yeah. help progress things forward. We can get some scientific and some yeah. academic stuff involved, and yeah. you know, the more people that talk about it, actually, we can start having different different yeah. open conversations. Absolutely, I and I think you know as well, like you know, these these corporations that uh, you know, whether it's Wright Patterson and you know Lockheed Martin, and I mean the people that are really trying to put a stop to to disclosure. It's no coincidence, you know, that again, you know, Representative Mike Turner is mm -hmm. from Ohio. That's where Wright Patterson Air Force Base is, and uh, it's just you can see the lobbyists and the and the politicians and potentially. I mean, they may not even know what's truly going on either, but they're paid off, and they're they're all they're doing is actually trying to defend their families and their way of being. So I don't even realize they I don't even think they realize how much of a a pawn in the game they are. Um. But, you know, it's just it's, the paradigm is, is, is begging to shift. You know, I think the, the corporate structure of charging for energy, and I think they would charge for air to breathe if they could, you know, because it's just a false, it's a false paradigm that um, I think, you know, we must move through or we're going to kill the planet and, and each other. Um, 
but yeah, endlessly fascinating. It's an endless conversation, you know. Um, so, so even with the nuclear aspect, just fascinating, right? What, yeah. what has been said? Yeah, there's 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 so much. I think there's so much out there for people. Certainly, people that are new to you know the subject and and, and have an interest, and you know, you you could spend you could spend a lifetime researching what's happened in the past and, and, you know, what's happening today. Yeah. There's, there's so much out there. And I think it's, it's an exciting time. Yeah. And I think some of the, some of the questions that have been there for, you know, for centuries are, are slowly starting to be answered or certainly working on them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a great, it's a, it's a good time to be alive. It's an amazing time to be alive. It's actually it's phenomenal to think that we are that we might be born into the the era where this this the disclosure happens. And you know, if you think about how lucky we are to like not have to be pulling horses around and having to go to out how you know we're living in a technological um, heyday, and it's probably quite primitive compared to what it's going to be. We just need to get over our fucking our shit and our hostility towards each other and the way we can share and be more abundant with our resources. Um, but it is, I mean, it's incredible. I, I think I actually saw, I don't know, maybe it was on a clip on like Joe Rogan, but I can't remember who, who said it. It was recent, but the idea being that, you know, we're only technological now. It's just, it's really a recent thing. You know, if we're born into this era, we think it's always been like this, but the computer is new. Uh, the microwave is new. The fax machine is actually quite new. All of this is quite new. And uh, but as we are becoming, especially with AI coming to the forefront and, and understanding of quantum computing, maybe that's the nature of the universe, that it is this non biological computer of sorts. I mean, again, who knows, but I think we're on the precipice of something really, really paradigm shifting. And uh, you know, and I think the dinosaurs want to hold on to what, you know, yeah. what they think uh, is. Yeah. But it's not permanent. Anyway. I agree. Yeah. Right, Tony, thank you so much. Hopefully we get to talk again um, in the future and, you know, yeah. perhaps things have, have progressed along a bit further. We will, we'll, um, fingers crossed. I think it's exciting. I'm excited. I think it's, I it's, it's, all, yeah. it's all positive, positive stuff. I think so too, you know, people, uh, I think just to be patient and keep the faith and just, uh, just, yeah, stay, stay kind. And, uh, I do think good things will come. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't lie forever. I think people do try governments yeah. have tried, but it's, uh, it's all coming out, which is amazing. You know, awesome. so yeah, brilliant. great to speak to you. Good to talk to you too, Tony, take care of yourself. Um, uh, I love your stuff, man. I, I love your energy. I really do. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jimmy. Yours too, dude. Thank you so much. Honestly, vice versa. Um, super positive and kind. And, and I can tell that you're coming from that place as well. So um, happy to chat any, anytime. Yeah, keep me posted and I'll, I'll do the same for sure. Awesome. Nice one. Take care of yourself, buddy. Hey, I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. You Bye-bye. Bye Cheers. now.